gracious, all that scares me sometimes. <laughs> okay, so now we gotta deliver on the promise of having an amazing, engaging, entertaining, not falling asleep after the chicken type uh, STEM symposium to welcome and congratulate uh, our current scholars, our future incoming scholars, and those that have not even been born yet. I am excited uh, to be here. A little bit um, extra about my journey. So when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a doctor, uh, discovered I did not like sick people, and so I needed a new plan. Uh, and around that time, we had all this conversation about if you like math and science, or even if you don't, you should think about math and science and computers and all this kind of stuff. I got to tell you the truth. Um, because I'm going to, to give you some real, real tough talk about the fact that this is hard, and I've got to admit it. I was born a geek, okay? There was probably a calculus equation on my forehead as I came out of the womb, and I, I owned that. But what I didn't own was liking it at all. I was very good at math and science, and I was competitive because I am competitive, but I didn't see what any of this had to do with my life or my life's mission, which incidentally still is to save the world. I didn't understand how math and science could have anything to do with that. But I was convinced to get into a program that was designed to get young ladies who were good at math and science to think differently about that. And the only reason I went into that program is because it was competitive. <laughs> I did not like math and science, but I loved to compete. Uh, and the prize for that particular competition was a week on a college campus without my parents. <laughs> so let us just say I put my best essay forward. <laughs> and out of that came a new understanding that this science, math, technology, computers, all that kind of stuff, they were just tools. And that I could use them for absolutely anything I wanted to do. They were my solution to saving sick people with having to, without having to be near them. So I invented the word biomedical engineering. I said, somebody's got to make the stuff that my doctor uses. So we'll just make up that word until I figure out what it actually is. And it turns out that that is literally what biomedical engineering is. And so that is how I actually started on this journey. I did my undergraduate. Uh, at uh, Duke University, um, and I really enjoyed it, right? But then I started to enjoy talking about it more, right? And the less you knew about what I was doing, the more I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> and that continued in graduate school, right? And I started to have this epiphany about, you know, there are those of us who like to talk to each other to keep building, and then there are those of us who like to lead those conversations and make sure that the world is ready for what it is we are about to unleash upon them. They call those people teachers and educators, and I realized that perhaps my version of saving the world was going to be to create an army of people involved in STEM, right? I was gonna get all the girls who wanted to be doctors but didn't like sick people, I was gonna help them into biomedical engineering, all of these different things, all of these, this creativity, this invention, things to be solved. Throughout that journey, um, I found myself obviously involved and immersed in STEM. I still, I now like it. I like learning new things. I like studying what else we are creating. But it also led me down several paths in which I was the first, right? So I was the first person in my family to go for a PhD. I'm proud to announce that as of the end of next year, I will simply be the third, because now I've got younger brothers and sisters who have followed me um, on that journey. I was one of the, I was the first African American to do research in the lab that I was doing research in at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I am the first uh, African American a lead for uh, science centers in the city of Detroit. Oh, Which, by the way, is weird, y'all. Just, just put out there, it's weird that I'm the first. Just put out there, it's a little weird. Um, but I am the first. I'm also pleased to say, interestingly enough, and this is going to lead to my point, that I am the second African-American lead of a science center in the country. the fact that I am second is because this is what being the first 
and being in STEM have in common. And this is what I want to leave you with today. The responsibility of both of those pathways, either being first or being in STEM, your ultimate responsibility is not to be the last. Mm -hmm. If you are called to be first, or if you are called in this field of STEM, your role is to open doors, set new sights, new visions, and make sure someone is coming behind you. We like to remember the folks that are building, right? We all know Steve Jobs, yeah. right? But we also all know that Steve Jobs did not invent the computer. Steve Jobs was fired from the company he founded. <laughs> that is a story in and of itself. He was able to build upon what other people had done, but that didn't make his contribution any less, right? Because with that foundation, he could think about it differently. Understand, the iPad doesn't turn 10 years old until next year. That is how much his thought process has revolutionized everything that we do. And if he is the last person to do something like that with personal and computer technology, we will be in trouble as a society, as a community. So when you are in this world of STEM, when you are going to be the first, be that the first scientist, be that the first engineer, be that the first to invent this, or the first to solve that, or the first to cure this, the first in your family to do X, the first woman you've ever seen to do Y, the first African American male you've seen to do Z, whatever it is, your responsibility is about not being the last. Right? And so we have some co qualities in common that are therefore required for both of these. One is resilience and determination, because calculus is hard. <laughs> We're just going to put that out there, and thermodynamics is even worse. Just buckle up. <laughs> so this is what happens, right? Both of these journeys do require resilience. The resilience, though, by defini definition means a preparedness to get knocked down. I think we forget to tell people that at the beginning of the journey, right? That the part about getting knocked down is not the sign of failure. It is proof of your resilience, but only if you get back up. So I'm telling you right now, one of these classes is going to kick you in the butt, maybe four of them. It's just going to happen, but it's about being resilient because in the real world, that is definitely what happens when you are innovating. Right? When you are discovering, when you are trying to cure something. If cancer wasn't about resilience, we would have cured it by now. And so if you are on your journey to be the top oncologist in the world, I need to know that you're going to get back up. Every for test that didn't work and for every solution that didn't do what it was supposed to. So that's about resilience and determination. Right? To keep going for it, to keep pushing through. It happens on both sides of the game. And I think it's something about science that we forget to tell people. There's this illusion that scientists are all geniuses. And we just sit in those labs or behind those books and stuff just comes to us. It just comes. <laughs> we didn't work for it, it just comes. My sister tells me that all the time. That is not true. We work for this. The difference between us and anyone else is just this relentless bit of resilience and determination in front of these really tricky problems. The second, um, young folks, y'all may have to explain this to the adult sitting next to you. Um, both STEM and being first require the ability to withstand the haters. So what do I mean? What do I mean? STEM scientists have haters? Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, yes, we do. And the reason behind that is if you are going to do something that has never been done before, you're going to be surrounded by people who can't see it, right? You're going to be surrounded by people who are afraid of it. And the reaction to that may simply be to get in your way, to tear you down. If you are the first out of your family, the first out of your neighborhood, the first out of your community, the first of anything, when you step into rooms, there are people in that room who have been there since the beginning of time and they do not appreciate the first of anything coming into that room and they will let you know. You may be the first to leave wherever it is you came from and they will not be happy to see you go. And they will also let you know you need to be calm. 
in that space. You need to have your own center and you need to actually understand that the louder they are, the righter you probably are on your path, mm -hmm. right? Because that's when you have to ratchet it up. When something amazing is about to happen, that's kind of when the voices come around that this kind of thing shouldn't happen. Both STEM and being first have that in common. The last thing is a very unique approach to adversity that borders on the weirdly being a fan of challenge. <laughs> so people who are scientists, engineers, mathematicians, biotechnologists, whatever it is, we kind of get jazzed around the problem, right? If there isn't a problem, you'll hear these people think, say things like, I need a challenge. I don't feel like I'm being challenged. What kind of problem do we have? What hasn't anyone else been able to figure out yet? So these are the kinds of things that folks will say when they're in that space, right? We don't just resist it, right? We aren't just determined to get through it. We aren't just turning deaf ears to the haters. We are in our happy space, right? We have found something that we can do that has not been done yet, and it's going to be hard. If it was easy, we might get bored, right? So that's, that's the <coughs> difference when you're talking to scientists. And anyone who is on their personal journey to be the first of anything also has that same relationship with adversity and challenge. We know. You know if you're going to be the first one that looks like you or thinks like you or does like you or came from where you came from in a room. There's going to be some challenge. There's going to be some interesting conversation. You may be doing your job while at the same time being a translator. You may be doing your job while at the same time being a bridge builder. And don't forget, you can't be the last one of you, whatever you're doing. So you are doing your job while also being best in class to make sure that when you leave, the only thing they want is two or three more just like you, right? So that is a different kind of space. So being in STEM, and being first are very, very similar. And I think that the biggest challenge around STEM these days is that we don't talk about it like that. We don't talk about it as being as important and as, as adventurous and as fun as being first at something. We don't talk about it as someone that, something that is open and accessible to everyone, right? If you're willing to work hard, if you have found your support system, if you manage to get to WCCD, you can actually make this happen. The other thing that these two things have in common, which is probably what drew me to STEM in the first place, is that what those engaged in science, technology, engineering, and math do is important. It's really important to the world that we live in. It is about solving our problems. It is about making better places. Flushing toilets with rainwater and all that geek speak that was going on with our two young ladies talking about water quality testing sounds like superficial, geeky, non-relevant stuff unless you live in Flint right now. Facebook live streaming sounds like just another game our kids can play or another way Mr. Zuckerberg is going to get rich until you find yourself in the passenger seat of a car while the driver is being shot and you need a way to tell that story. So what we do in this world, in our world of STEM, of science, technology, engineering, and math is important. It makes change. It makes a difference. It has value. And I think that we are losing some of the greatest minds that should be coming to do what we do because we don't remind them of that. I run into people every day who hate math. And then they'll turn around and tell me about a problem they want to solve or something they want to fix. So we can find all kinds of folks who want to do good, who want to do better, who want to make a change. But they don't know that STEM has anything to do with this. So in your own heads, in your own minds, think of two problems that are personal to you. One can be silly and simple. One can be big and broad. Just two problems. Just two. Just two. And when you have time for the rest of the week, 
I dare you to imagine how STEM could solve one of those problems, if not both of them. My silly problem is still the driver's seat of my car. See, I know now we got the nice buttons on it that adjust the seat, it goes up and down and back and forth, but here's the challenge as a woman. Sisters, help me out. The shoe game affects where the seat needs to be, right? What I need is a car that senses the height of my heels, so then it puts my seat in the right place. Simple, simple problem. We should be able to solve with some technology. My big problem is my dad and his diabetes. God bless him. No matter how many times we're talking about what to eat, what not to eat, it's a lot of information, right? And it's so much information, you can make all the excuses for chocolate chip cookies and cavassier that you need to make. <laughs> and so this is part of the challenge. What I need is not something that measures your overall insulin. What I need is something that measures immediate sugar intake and can tell him exactly what's happening. Can he test the cookie and figure out before he puts it in his mouth exactly what's gonna happen in the next 15 minutes? I need something like that, yeah. right? So that, that's a big thing. So I wanna just close by saying, this is the world that you all live in. This is the world that we live in, and I am so glad to have company, because I think that this is an amazing space to be. I think that um, the way we think the way we approach the world and our willingness to stay in the fight until these problems are solved and to think about doing it creatively is one of the greatest gifts that any cohort, any group of individuals will give to our world. Do not underestimate what you are about to bring to the table. We need you. We are proud of you. And if it was easy, it still wouldn't be a problem. If you aren't first, it won't get done. And if you are not last, your journey and all the bumps and bruises that went with it will be well worth all the work that you have taken on. So thank you for what you are about to take on and congratulations for everything you have already done to get right here to this moment in the first place. Thank you.